There's the button. Wee. Okay. So uh, I took a class this spring. Uh, actually, a couple classes. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> Maximizing war. So one of the classes I took was uh, software architecture, where we did a bunch of like documentation of um, doing like. Um, object relational maps and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, mostly at a very abstract level. Um, the other class I took was Introduction to Linear Optimization, also known as Linear Programming. Um, so when I, this was, uh, this presentation was originally my uh, term project of like at the end of the class, like um, taking what we learned and applying it to something that was more or less real. Um, We'll get into how real it was later. Um, but so I need to give a little bit of background information to make some of this make sense. So linear optimization is a field of mathematics that was really not a thing until around like um, it was the 20th century um, discovery of some of these concepts. And so the idea is it's a field where you uh, are solving for a system of equations um, where you have, you're trying to either maximize or minimize something along a set of constraints. Um, so a really good example, this is an example, I think this is on Wikipedia, of um, let's say you're running a farm. Um, your objective is to like get as much revenue from that farm as possible, but your, your constraints are the area, the fertilizer you have, the pesticides you have, um, and you, your area obviously can't be negative. That's actually an important part of linear optimization is, is non-zero constraints. Um, so the other applications for this are um, a lot of, uh, yeah, operations research is the big one where you say you have like five factories and they can produce any of these different number of products. Um, what is the, the right optimization, the optimal setup for each of those factors? Um, to, to maximize your profit kind of fail. Um, other examples are um, the traveling salesman problem, as it's known, where you've got um, X number of points that you need to hit among a certain number of people, and um, what's the optimal way for those people to travel uh, to make sure that each of those houses gets hit. Um, so that's, that's another cool area of this. Um, I'll, one of the like more modern applications of this is with, I think it's with CAT scans, um, where like they're actually doing a lot of like image optimization, where um, they can kind of piece together um, what what the scan should look like with a lot less data than they used to. Um, it's It has a lot of applications in like sparse data processing, which I don't fully understand. So we'll move on from that. Um, but part of the idea here is if you map uh, the system of equations um, the real mathematical power behind this is you don't have to, to um, test every possible um, set of values. Um, so if you graph it, this is uh, uh, this is, looks pretty bad on this screen, but um, the this is I guess I don't I can't tell how many planes are in this. Maybe three or four. Um, so if you make that three dimensional um, object out of the equations. Um, the only possible optimal solutions are the ones at the corner points, the one the, that are marked in red on this. So you don't actually have to explore every possible um, value along every one of those edges. Um, the, the optimal solution has to be at one of those corner points. So that means you're moving from an infinite world of things to go check to a very finite amount of, of points that you actually have to go check for the solution. And here's a more complex one. You know, it, some of these shapes can get pretty ridiculous. Um, I'm only showing you ones that have a limited number of planes, but these can get wild. Um, so one of the um, the applications. So um, there are lots of little mathematical tricks with some of these um, problems based on what kind of properties they have, um, and there are commercial software solver packages for this particular purpose um, that solve complicated optimization problems. Um, and one of the, the first ones that was big, I think, was called Cplex. Um, Cplex was, I believe, bought by IBM at some point, and some of the people who had worked on Cplex and started this new one called Gorobi. Um, so Gorobi is kind of the industry standard these days of a commercial um, 
linear optimization solver, um, as, as well as other types of like really complex math problems. Um, so one of the uh, cases on the Roby's website is the NFL. Uh, the NFL uses a Garobi to plan their schedule every year. Um, so they have their constraints are like, well, we have these number of time slots across the season. Um, these teams, because they're in the same division, need to play each other at some point over the season. Um, I believe they also put like strength of schedule stuff in there, where like um, they want um, they they mix up which teams have harder schedules in what year, um, and then they also want to optimize for their own profit. That's really the the main thing they're optimizing for is hey, let's make sure like when we schedule this that like say like Cowboys and Eagles is on a Sunday night. They want like the top teams. Um, based on performance and previous viewership and revenue um, to be in the, the prime time slots um, uh, to, to kind of maximize their viewership and their ad revenue and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they end up, you know, hundreds and thousands of constraints in this problem um, and have to run it through this, you know, help a big software package that's running the cloud. Like it's, it takes a lot of computing power, even knowing this mathematical shortcut that it has to be at, a, at an endpoint. So is the... It so the number of planes is is that that's related to the number that's of the number of constraints. So, I applied this to other sports. In this particular case, baseball. Uh, so baseball has this uh, advanced stat that's known as wins above replacement WAR. Um, and what wins above replacement is trying to measure is uh, is this. Uh, if a player got injured and their team had to replace them with any random minor league player or a quadruple A player, basically just they would have no net effect is, is, is the idea. If you put them out of the field, they would have no net effect on the team's win or loss record. Um, how much the, would value would the team lose by putting out a replacement level player versus someone who's actually producing at an above average level? Um, that's that's what war means. So uh, for a typical baseball player who's in the majors, um, they might have like one or two war per season. Um, uh, unless they're just not very good, then they, we could be talking zero. There is occasionally players with negative war who are hanging around for whatever reason. Um, but in general, you want a player with greater than zero war um, on your team. Uh, so uh, this is how war is actually measured. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot to it. Uh, one of the big ideas with war is um, to try to get a measurement that is um, independent of the time that player played. Um, so uh, kind of one of the original ideas behind introducing war was like, well, I want to compare like a player who's playing now to like Babe Ruth. Like how would they compete against each other? You know, um, and I mean, when you think about it, from a pure human performance standpoint, like probably 90% of major leaguers right now would outperform anything that Babe Ruth could do um, in today's major leagues. But this tries to measure them against their current, against their, the competition in their era. And that's, that's kind of the big point for. So the, ex the problem that I designed was how can you create a team that has the maximum amount of war given the typical constraints that you would have in building a team? Um, and so this, I started to approach the problem from a um, like very practical, I'm a general manager running a team, like I want to put together the best team. And then I quickly realized that actually the most useful application of this is fantasy baseball, which I've never played, but this, this is actually very useful for that. Um, so the constraints are you have you know, a total amount of salary that you can pay players. Um, there are 25 players on a team, and then you need to make sure you need to make sure that all of your positions are covered. Um, you need to make sure that you have a first baseman and a second baseman. Um, maybe you have a utility player in there who can play a few different positions, but you need to make sure that every position is covered by somebody. So I ran a simulation where I have actually I'll jump over to the the actual Ryan, uh, code. Harper on the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so I actually got a bunch of fan graphs. Uh, they're a big source of like baseball stats. Um, I got a bunch of fan graphs data um, for um, basically projections for this year for pitchers and for batters. Um, 
big dump of some CSV data. I cleaned it up a little bit to make it easy to work with. Um, and then threw it into a IPython notebook, or now known as Ju Jupyter. Jupyter. I'm actually not sure if you say Jupyter or Jupyter. Um, but yeah, this is a, uh, have any of y'all worked with like a notebook type thing like this before? Um, I hadn't, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so what you can do is you've got this, this um, UI in the browser, um, and you've actually got your, your code like here in line. Um, with, and you could put like comments and headlines and stuff. And so like, what I can actually do is like, um, here's all my constraints, there's my objective. I can actually like rerun this code right now. Um, that failed for who knows what reason. Uh, I guess I should run the whole thing. There we go. Now all the cells run. And there's my solution. Um, so yeah, I, I put together using Garobi Python package. Um, I import the player data. I set my constraints, um, like the salary constraint, the roster size. I make sure that each of those positions I named is covered by some player. Um, and then, hey, let's let's try to maximize the war based on all those constraints. Um, and so yeah, the, I set the uh salary pretty wide open um <laughs> uh and assuming that all players were available and and that's just not a realistic constraint um in in an actual situation either for an actual team in real life or a fantasy team players will become unavailable you won't have the entire world of players available um but if you were to have the entire world of players available your roster would look something like this if you're trying to stay under a certain salary um, so yeah, you would never have, uh, that, that's a ridiculous team. Um, yep. but, but you can, uh, one of the interesting things that comes out of this is it optimizes for the absolute best players. Um, so look at, um, say like the pitching rotation. Um, there are actually probably some pitchers with higher war out there, um, than, than Keiko or Arietta or Gray, but, um, guys like Mike Trout, and Bryce Harper and Mookie Betts were so valuable that the formula optimized for get those guys first, um, and and then you can fill in with with who will will fill out the rest of the roster, and that's how you end up with guys like uh, David Robertson and Chad Green, who are decent relievers, but nowhere near as valuable to a team as as one of those outfielders with really high WAR. So. Uh, could, could, uh, sorry, could, ahead, could you uh, dial the optimization in to optimize for uh, that case that you just described, basically? Like, um, can you kind of hone it in on a specific, with more constraints, I guess? Yeah, you could absolutely, like, say, hey, it's more important to me that, like, a relief pitcher is really good, because um, maybe I highly value, like, their clutch ability to, like, close out a short inning or whatever. Um, you could weight their war as more valuable than than an outfielder's is. You could definitely do that. But I, I, I left it as if it were all equal. And did I see that right that when you ran that, um, it ran in like zero seconds? Like it ran in like zero seconds? Uh, yeah, it's pretty fast. No, sure. OK. Huh. Um, and actually, let's, uh, where is my salary? Um, let's actually tone down the salary and see how it changes, um, that'd be fun. So I had it set at 260, $260 million, um, which is, I think there's only a couple actual major league teams that have that high of a salary. Um, but I, this was a, a pretty standard level for fantasy baseball that I found. Um, but let's like tune it down to like 120. Let's go a lot lower. Also, how many do um, you have in place? Like four? What was the question? Well, how many total constraints do you have in place? Um, so each of the position players, um, like every position is its own constraint. So there's, I guess, uh, nine constraints from that, plus salary, plus roster size. So we're looking at uh, 11, 12 constraints around there. So really not a whole lot um, for a, a typical problem of this scope um, when you're 
you know, in operations research, you'd probably be dealing with 40 or 50 constraints at least. Um, I mean, you probably want at least two uh, of, of each position, right? I mean, right. Yeah, there's so also to, like, I mean, different ways you can cut the team. Yeah. Right. So I just cut down the costs, and you can see that uh, Mike Trout is so valuable that he's still obviously need to have him on the team. But yeah, so a lot of these other players now we're looking at much cheaper players. Um, now that I've I've turned down the the cost uh, constraint. So, uh, some interesting challenges I had with this uh, were just, I mean, the data was kind of in several different formats, kind of had to massage the data a little bit to, to get it into a way that I could parse easily with Python. Um, another big question is what happens when you have a player who plays multiple positions? Um, so, for example, on the Astros, Marvin Gonzalez can play just about everything except pitcher. Um, I guess he doesn't catch either, but he probably any could. anything else. He could pitch in a 17 He probably could. Yeah. Knowing him, he probably could. Um, so the this the way this was calculated assigned no extra value to someone who could play multiple positions, even though it is that is definitely a valuable thing. Um, I also ignored the designated hitter. Um, just because the the way that war is calculated for a DH, um, it basically there's no fielding. So a lot of times DHs are kind of artificially deflated. Um, so I just kind of ignore that as a thing. Um, and then you, actually, uh, Joe, you brought this up as positional priorities. Like what happens if, um, like, hey, I really want some good relief pitchers, or a lot of teams put a lot more stock into a catcher than they do anybody else, just because that's a much harder role to fill in a particular particular niche that not as many people have a specialty in. Um, and then there's Shohei Otani, um, who is on the Angels. Uh, he's actually hurt right now, got hurt since I did this presentation, um, came over from Japan this year, um, but he is both a pitcher and a good hitter. Um, and so he appeared on both lists and really messed up my day. <laughs> like, I don't want to deal with that. Um, so yeah, more, more interesting ways that this could have been modeled is to actually optimize it for fantasy baseball, where um, fantasy baseball is not scored exactly along war. War is really, um, all these, these war um, values that were attached to these players were projections for, for this season. Um, so it might not necessarily be, turn out to be actually how good they are. Um, but one thing that we could actually get more sophisticated about is um, if a fantasy baseball league uses like hits and runs and whatever, we can actually use last year's hits and runs and all those stats um, to assign them value instead of war um, to make it more precise along how valuable of a player they are for fantasy baseball. Um, and then uh, another interesting question would be, um, I said I kept the salary pretty high. Um, what if I try to build the most uh, efficient team? So I'm actually trying to minimize my salary at the same time that I'm trying to maximize war. That's a quite a bit more complex um, problem for the solver to handle, um, but it is not unsolvable. Um, so I could actually do that. It was like, hey, what's the, the min-max? Um, what would that look like? I'm guessing it would turn out to be around 100 million or so, and that's actually probably, for most major league teams, um, within the range of, of salaries they actually have. Um, they're probably doing those kind of calculations for real. And then uh, another thing is, what if I put players out of position? Um, with somebody like Mike Trout, who is just like so valuable, um, what would happen if I instead stuck him at first base and got another outfielder who's who's super valuable? Um, what would that look like? Um, that's not something I tried to address in this model. So to actually kind of turn this into a, an application that would be useful for fantasy baseball, um, obviously put like a UI on it. That'd be kind of cool. Um, you could actually use it as like a draft board of like, all right, this is my ideal team. And as people go around and draft players, um, you can mark them as unavailable um, so that your draft board updates with who's, who would be most valuable for you to get right now. Um, so that would yeah, be the main thing is marking players as unavailable. Um, and then again, positional priorities. Um, like I said, maybe you're someone who values catchers a lot. Um, like a lot of teams actually do. Um, you can set the, hey, it's most important to me to get a really good catcher. Um, and 
then you could also have um, kind of favorite players. Like, let's say that like you've got somebody like I'll bring up Marwin Gonzalez, who can bring a who can play like seven positions. Maybe you were like, man, I really, really want him on my fantasy team. You can lock him in um, to be like, yes, always have Marwin in this setup uh, if he's available. And then other players just around. That would be a, an actual thing that would need to be implemented to make this useful. Any questions on that? So it is a little bit like uh, linear optimization of baseball. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, would it be possible for you to actually like set up this team and see how they do it this year? Is that, is that possible? Well, you could. What you could do is is once you have their like roster that because based on these projections, like you could actually compare that roster against the final oh, actual yeah, actual yeah, at the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. Going, see, I'm immediately imagining like a you know. Um, some sort of microstate where you can you can actually uh, you can actually keep the simulation, and then as as the draft goes on, you can actually transition to make that player unavailable. Yep. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and what's cool about that is then you can actually project different scenarios. Like if it goes, if this team gets this, then this is what it will be. Right. Uh, but because you're not actually, you're just you know basically exploring different areas of the graph. Yep. Uh, it would be cool to actually use it as a drafting tool. Uh, so, so Joe is asking me how many constraints I have. Um, there weren't a whole lot of constraints, but there were a lot of variables in this um, because every player is a variable. Um, but again, like Garobi is so all these these solvers at this point are so finely tuned that even that is just not that hard of a problem for them to solve. Yeah, I was going to ask about Garobi. Like, um, so. Is it kind of just a, a black box? Like, as far as the math is concerned underneath the hood, it seemed like from your code examples, I mean, I didn't get a very good look, but it seemed like you can just kind of set your constraints, let it do its thing, and it does its thing. Exactly. Pretty well. Yep. Uh, OK. That's interesting. And it's uh, pretty, pretty fault tolerant, too. Um, I mean, there are ways that you, you can, um, there are definitely optimization problems that you can come up with that are just really aren't solvable. Um, <laughs> and sometimes, uh, even ones that are like pretty hard to solve, just meaning they they require a lot of computing power. Um, Groby has you know certain heuristics under the hood uh, mm -hmm. that make it easy to to still solve ones that are technically pretty hard. And that's an open source. It's not, uh, okay. but I, what's weird about it is the um, I guess I mean a lot of the underpinnings were from that previous software package Cplex I mentioned, so, and yeah. then Cplex. That is not either, but um, like the patent situation was such that they could just basically like pick up where they left off and on this new one. So this has been you know several decades under development, um, getting it to the point where it is now. Um, so it's it's not open source, but all the math is in the public domain somewhere, and that's that's really its secret sauce is just math tricks. What do you? Yeah, it's funny you say secret sauce. Like I worked at a. A sourcing company, and this was the secret sauce. Uh, <laughs> they had written essentially a clone of Garobi or whatever. And mm. was, if it was open source, I would have been like, "Oh, they could have just been using that." Yeah, no, it's it's uh, like it's really expensive software. Um, and I have like an academic license that was super restricted, but it's I think it's like seven, eight thousand dollar license kind of deal. Well, that's not too bad compared to what we were saving, you know, large companies. Uh, but yeah, any. any any sourcing solution like SAP, uh, like that type of stuff, they're all that. That's how this, those all work, basically. Right. Exactly. Uh, cool. I'm really glad we got to talk about combinatorics today. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun subject. All right. Well, that was fun. We got some baseball in. Yeah. Why is Mike Trout's war so high? <laughs> He's so good. He is so good. It's too bad his team isn't that good. What does he do? Yeah, what is he? What's his? What's his? What is it? He's an outfielder for the Los Angeles Angels. Which means he catches the ball. Yeah, he catches, and he's a really, really good hitter. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody.
Thanks, Jeffrey. That was awesome. Yep.